Reformation Sunday. In our culture, this weekend is all about what? Halloween. Halloween, yes, right? So this is what our culture starts to look at. And so we think in terms of jack-o'-lanterns and Halloween. And, you know, if you go look up some stuff on Halloween, you'll find that uh, Halloween is one of these really interesting things because you really can't figure out exactly where Halloween came from. You can go back and look at some Celtic stuff. You can look at some Druid stuff. The reality is, is that what we celebrate uh, these days and uh, called Halloween here in the United States of America is such a hodgepodge of stuff that's come from all sorts of different cultures from all around the world to the point where we almost can't suggest what it is anymore. Now, that isn't for your pastor to say that there isn't a side of this that has some, some icky side to it. There's certainly that piece, and as you're parenting and grandparenting children and all those kinds of things to understand those pieces, but the reality is, is that our culture has gotten to a spot where this whole thing is no longer really attached to the spiritual side of things. Because if you understand where Halloween comes from, it's just this push together of a couple of different Latin words that come from All Hallows' Eve. The reality is, is that uh, October 31st, though we call it Halloween, is All Hallows' Eve because November 1st in the church for literally centuries has been All Saints' Day. And if you start looking back and understand where this particular cultural phenomenon came from, it came from an understanding within the church that there was this spot between heaven and hell that people got stuck in. And that when you died, you didn't necessarily know whether you wound up in heaven or hell. And the goal, obviously, isn't to wind up in hell, so the goal is to wind up in heaven. But if you're someone who has a loved one who you think might be stuck somewhere between heaven and hell, there's the side of you that says, how do I help my loved one get out of there? And so when we start talking about Reformation Day and we start talking about Halloween and you start mushing these whole things together, there's so many things that collide here that we don't even understand what they are anymore. And the reality is that our culture has turned this into just a phenomenon for being able to dress up in costumes, walk around to our neighbor's houses, gather together in church parking lots and be able to just have some fun getting some free candy. Can I get an amen on free candy? Yeah, that's good stuff. But here's the thing. That's not really what Halloween's about. As a matter of fact, Halloween has simply become a cultural deal where people make a whole lot of money. As I was doing a little bit of research this past week, do you know that uh, we're all in the wrong business? The business we ought to be in is making costumes for animals. Because I read somewhere that 30 million people spent a half a billion dollars, a half a billion with a B, on costumes for their animals for this coming weekend. Holy smokes, I need to take up stowing or something. <laughs> so what do we do with that? All Hallows Eve. What I'm telling you is I love what our church has done. I love when the church comes and basically takes back a piece of our culture and uses it to be able to make it about connecting with our neighbors and being the church on mission, as Paul just talked to us about. But sometimes it's really helpful for us to understand again what it really is about. And when you begin to understand that when Martin Luther, of all people, when we think in terms of the Reformation, we're part of this thing called the Lutheran Church, and this guy named Martin Luther was a monk in the Catholic Church, and quite frankly, he never wanted to create a new church. He simply wanted to reform the one that he was part of, but he ended up getting excommunicated from that church because he nailed these 95 theses to the Wittenberg door. And in the process of doing that, he was wrestling through this whole question that we all ask at some point, which is, what must I do to gain eternal life? What Martin Luther did was very intentional. On All Hallows' Eve, the night when people are lighting candles, lighting up jack-o'-lanterns to be able to scare away evil spirits, when we're going to worship services to pray for those that are stuck between heaven and hell, when we're sitting and talking about a church body that's gotten itself so far off course that we're to the point where we sell something called indulgences, and if you pay for them, you can get your loved one out quicker. And you start to see what the subject line is of all of these things, and that's the issue we got to deal with within the church when we talk about the Reformation, we talk about Halloween and All Hallows' Eve and All Saints' Day. Is there anything wrong with praying for our loved ones? Of course not. But here's the thing, guys. As Christ followers who understand what Scripture says, there's no point in praying for people that have already died because the gavel has dropped. The judgment is in. I promise you they're not stuck between heaven and hell. But here's the more sobering thought. They're in one or the other. And what we've got to hang on to within the church is the fact that there's only one way we get to heaven. And Jesus made it abundantly clear that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That's the truth of Scripture. And so we hang on to that. 
You see, Martin Luther was this monk that was trying to live in a time where that was up for question. It was up for debate, and we're sitting here talking about indulgences in this, this in-between time. And so he nails these 95 theses to the Wittenberg door, and it was simply questioning what was going on in the church is what Martin Luther was wrestling with is to say, look, I, I, I love this church. I love God. I want to do the right thing, but as I read Scripture, I cannot, I cannot find something that supports what I'm learning. And so he finally puts these things on the door on the night when people are praying, lighting candles, and doing what they do to try to pray for those that are stuck in between and simply, in essence, raising his hand and saying, I think we need to talk about this. And then things started to blow up from there. Martin Luther found himself in all sorts of different spots where he was trying to defend what he had written. He got excommunicated from the church. Eventually, Martin Luther, um, as he died, he died excommunicated from the church. And so that was a challenge for him. But he was wrestling through the question of what, what do I do when Scripture doesn't seem to support what the church is doing? And how do, we, how do we settle that issue within the church? And so this thing called the Lutheran Church came out of a movement of people out of a Reformation age that simply said, the church has to, has to go back to its roots. I asked myself this question, who cares? Who cares what the background of Halloween is? Who cares what the background of Reformation is? Who cares who that guy is? Like, who cares? And I find myself wrestling through the question, if I can't answer that in some kind of compelling way for you sometime this morning, then something's wrong. Because the whole issue of the Reformation gets down to the critical issue that each one of us has, which in this life, we recognize that this life is only a mist. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. And the thing that we hang on to with everything that we've got is knowing that there's something that comes after this. Because if there's not, the Apostle Paul says that we're to be pitied more than all men. But what we hang on to is that Scripture says, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that there is. So here's the thing I want to remind you of before we jump into something else. This word sola comes from the Latin word one or alone, like by itself. And this word stands for scripture. And what I want to remind you of today, this is just the deal. If you've ever had any question where all of our beliefs come from in this church, they come from scripture, period. It's why every time you walk into this place, there's scripture on the screen. Because we believe that the only source of everything that we believe and teach in this place comes from God's Word, period. And if it comes from something else, then it doesn't belong here. Now, that doesn't mean we don't bring in a story or try to wrestle through something to be able to give you a little bit of an idea as to what Scripture is saying so that you have context and understanding. But what we believe and teach is founded solely in the pages of Scripture. And then from that comes these three, sola gratia, sola fide, sola Christus. This is the whole issue of grace, unearned, undeserved. We're going to lean into that today. This issue is faith, and it reminds us that how do we get grace? By faith. Where do we get the idea of grace? From Scripture. And who makes it all possible? In Christ alone, period. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Where do we get that? In Scripture alone. That's the message of Scripture. It's the message from the beginning to the end, and when the church loses sight of that, and we start putting the subject in the wrong spot in the sentence. Those of you that can't stand English grammar, too bad. You're getting a lesson today. You got a subject, you got a verb, and then you got what? A direct object. Remember these days? We can start doing this whole little thing where remember when you had to graph these things out? Man, that brings back nightmares for me. But here's the thing, right? You've got a subject, you've got a verb, the subject is the one doing the verb, the one receiving the action of the verb is the object. And we can never, ever lose sight of the fact that here's the way Scripture puts this thing. God is the subject, He does the action, we are the recipient of the action. End of discussion. Got it? All right, here we go. Let's jump into this. Here's the thing I think we've got to wrestle through, the big question. I want to jump into Matthew 20 with you today. It's the story where Jesus is talking with his disciples, and this guy walks up to him, and he asks this really critical question that I think at the end of the day, we all struggle with. And some of you are going to see this question in just a minute and go, Tim, I don't struggle with that. And I'm going to make a case this morning that at the end of the day, we all struggle with this. And it's why the church has to constantly remind ourselves is to why it has to reform. It constantly has to keep reminding itself that God is the subject, we are the object. 
And so this, this young man comes up to Jesus and he asks, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? I'm going to pull that question out. What must I do? Do you see where the subject is off? The question is already reversing this. And when we get to the spot, there's something innately inside of us that wants to ask the question, what must I do? Part of this is just our American way. Some of it's our desperate need to be independent. Some of it is our need to want to be able to say, I did it. I mean, you watch every kid in life as they start to grow up and they finally can do something by themselves. They, they finally push their parent away, right, and say, I got it. I can do this. And there's something in us spiritually that wants to do that to our Heavenly Father that finally says, I got it. I can do this. And what our Heavenly Father keeps reminding us of, and what I want you to hang on to this morning if you hear nothing else from me is this. You can't do it. Can't. We got to ask a different question. What's interesting is when Jesus was talking to this rich young man, he got to the spot where he said, all right, look, listen. Because the guy says to him, what must I do to, to, to gain eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you got to keep the commandments, right? And so he starts rattling off the commandments. And what's funny to me in this moment is the guy actually looks at Jesus. Just picture this moment, right? So Jesus is saying, look, you got to do this. You got you to love God. You got to love others. You can't steal. You can't, you, you can't murder. You can't be envious. You can't, right? He's just going through this. And the guy, the guy looks at him and seriously says, all of that I've done. Right. I mean, if I had been Jesus, I think I would, you know, think about what Jesus knows at this point. He's both man and God, so the God side knows everything this guy's done. I mean, I, I'd probably just be pulling up a spreadsheet going, hey, buddy, let, let me show you this just for a minute. Like, here was where he broke the seventh commandment 87 times, right? But Jesus just lets it go. He just lets it go. And instead what he does is lets that one slide, and he says, okay, I'll tell you what. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go sell everything you've got, give your money to the poor, and then come follow me. And what scripture records is that the man walked away sad because he had great wealth. So why did he walk away sad? Well, because he was doing just fine when Jesus said keep the commandments, or at least he thought he was. But when Jesus got to the one thing that he was struggling to let go of, whew. And so then the disciples are kind of wrestling and they're watching Jesus do this and and they're like, well, Jesus, I mean, if that guy who kept all the commandments, I mean, for, I, if he can't get into heaven, then who can? And Jesus says, well, let me, let me tell you this. It's easy for a camel to walk through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. I thought this was the funniest part of this whole deal, right? Just so you know, that needle is not to scale. <laughs> it's either a really small camel or a really big needle. I had the opportunity to be able to uh, travel to Israel, and what was interesting to me was when I was in Israel, the, you know, it's going to be hard to see on the white, so I'm going to draw it small over here. So picture a city gate, right? Big old monstrous city gate, and here's the wall, right? And if I could actually draw a person small enough, he'd be down here. So that's some sort of human being. I don't know what that is. Okay, so what, the, what our tour guide was telling us was, look, those gates are so big, that takes a lot of energy and effort to be able to open them. And sometimes you don't want them open because if something were to happen to the city, think about how much it would take to close those gates quickly to be able to stop some enemy or whatever from coming. So what most of the time happened was in these big city gates, there's a little door down here. And what our tour guide told us is that's often called the eye of the needle. And I went, huh, never thought about that before. I always thought about this, you know, not to scale needle over here. But this is what it did to my faith life all of a sudden. I thought to myself, well, the camel might be able to get through that door. And if that's what we're talking about, then maybe what Jesus is saying is it may be hard but with a lot of effort, you know, get one shoulder through and then the next leg and get down. I mean, that camel might be able to get through the eye of the needle. And then, hey, I got there. 
And then I had to wrestle through my own faith life of being able to go, no, 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 no. Here's what Jesus said. The disciples heard this and they were greatly astonished. Well, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them with, man, this is what? Impossible. Impossible. But you see, there was something innately inside of me that wanted to go with the story of being able to go, but the camel might be able to get through. And it forced me to wrestle through with my own self to get to that side that goes, Tim, you cannot do it. I'm not the subject of the sentence. So it's impossible with man, but with God, all things are possible. Oh, which puts the subject back in the right spot and puts me back in the object side, because with me it's impossible, but with God it's possible. And you, disciples crack me up sometimes. I read scripture with such a different lens these days. I, I find myself just going, I can just imagine Jesus looking at these guys, telling them it'd be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. And then the disciples are like, well, then who can get in? To which Jesus is like, look, with God, this is possible. With man, it's impossible. And then, and then after he says that, then Peter answers him, but Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. What's going to be left for us? I'm surprised at moments that Jesus didn't just finally go, I've had it with you guys, whatever, you know. I'm going to go find 12 new disciples and see if I can find somebody who understands anything. But he didn't. And that is the grace of God. So then where does this thing go? When you understand this issue, undeserved, unearned, that's what makes it grace. And the minute you earn it at any level, the minute you deserve it at any level, 99% you don't deserve it, 1% you do, not grace. What makes it grace is that you are 100% undeserving. What we recognize is that what we deserve is to be eternally separated from God. And instead of him walking away, and instead of him walking away from the disciples, what a great example of his love for us, right? Instead of leaning away from us, he, he draws us in, keeps pursuing. That's what grace does. So then you move on to the next part of the story, and this is one of these parables that every time I read it, just somewhere between infuriates me and frustrates me. Because it's, an, it, it's, it's a hit straight between my eyes that deals with my own pride issues, my own issues of, of faith life, and understanding what this issue of the church has to remember, has to remember what we're about. So let me take you through this story. Jesus said, for the kingdom of heaven's like a landowner, went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius. We could sit and talk about what a denarius is, but I don't have time for that. The bottom line is, if you look, at, if you look this thing up, denarius was in essence the uh, average uh, daily pay for somebody. So just to make life easy and to at least get you guys somewhat motivated, I'm asking how many of you would be willing to work uh, at church this coming week for 250 bucks for one day? We, we got some work we need to get done. Anybody willing to do that? Anybody? Okay, we got a couple people. Man, how much do I have to pay you people? Um, 500,000, what do we, okay. All right, Let, let's, let's see, I'll, I'll make this more lucrative. How many of you will come here for $1,000 this week to do a little bit of work? All right, there's more hands going. All right, we're getting some people motivated. For $1,000, I'm willing to hire all of you, be here at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, we good? Okay, you didn't know that piece, but 6 a.m., it'll be fine. 12 hours of work, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., I'll give you $1,000 plus lunch, we good? Okay, all right, we'll even get it from Tejas, that's good stuff. All right, so I'm gonna pay you $1,000 for the day and then send you out. Good? Perfect. Then the way, the way the rest of the story goes is the landowner so, um, goes out again at 9 o'clock because there's just so much work to do and finds a few more people and he says, hey, can, can you come and, and I'll pay you a fair wage, right? Doesn't tell him what he's going to pay him, just says, I'll pay you a fair wage. Goes out again at noon, goes out again at 3, goes out at 5 o'clock, one hour before closing time, and brings all these people in. And then it comes to this moment. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard says to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired, the guys that just came in at five o'clock, and going on to the first. 
And the workers who were hired at about five o'clock in the afternoon came and each of them received a prorated basis of 1,000 divided by 12. That's too hard of math. I should have told you it was $1,200 and I'd know what I was doing, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna prorate this thing down and I don't know, we're gonna pay these guys like $200. You know what the landowner paid them? Thousand bucks. Are you kidding me? I've been here since 6 a.m. And the only thing I get that's more than them is the lunch? It's where we wind up going, isn't it? There's a side of us that struggles with grace. We know we need it. We know that we, we will never have eternity without it. But man, when others receive it, and it doesn't feel fair, we struggle. And so the church becomes like this. So when those who were hired first came, they expected to receive more. I mean, if those guys are going to get 1,000, then clearly the guy's going to give me 2,500 now or something. I mean, we, we got to even this thing out. But each one of them also received $1,000. And when they received it, they began to grumble. Friends, I think that's what we got to wrestle with. It's a heart issue, right? Of this realization that this isn't a comparison game of looking at, you know, what did you get and what did you get and what did you get and what did you get? This is an issue between me and God. And God said, Tim, here's the deal. I sent my son to die for you. He rose for you. He's got a place prepared for you. And if you believe that, you'll spend eternity in heaven. It's between me and God. And if everybody else is there too, praise God. And Jesus looked at him and said, don't I have the right to do with what I want with my own money? Let's get it out of money and say, doesn't he have his right to do with what he wants with grace? Are you mad because I'm generous? Are any of us mad about having a generous God? Of course we're not. Our eternal inheritance depends on it. So then what is it within our hearts that struggles with it? The issue of grace is this way. And then as people who've received grace upon grace upon grace, what we're called to be is people that give grace to the world. I thought this was a great way to just force us to wrestle with something. As I close this morning, I want you to think in terms of deal with your own heart issue on this this week. And ask yourself the question that when somebody gets something that they don't deserve, that somehow feels like a, some sort of slight to you, do you rejoice with them over the grace they've received? Or do you find yourself turning inward and going, that's not fair. And I want each one of us to wrestle with God's grace. Because here's where Luther turned. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. There's no more clear verse in Scripture than this. For it is by grace you've been saved. And how do we receive that grace? It's still not a subject of yours. Faith is what grabs hold of this that makes that possible. It's a gift of God, not by anything you and I do, so that none of us can boast. The grace of God, unearned, undeserved, given freely by a God who loves us unconditionally. That's what Scripture says. That's what this church stands on. That's what gives us hope. Let's pray. Father God, we thank and praise you for the privilege of being able to gather together in this house. We recognize that we live in a world and in a culture that has all sorts of different practices and things that they do at this time of year, but it's also a reminder to us that when we peel back all the layers, it still gives us a chance to be able to celebrate your grace. God, I love it when we can take cultural things of this world and redeem them and take them back for the sake of the gospel. 
And so God, as we uh, find ourselves walking around neighborhoods tomorrow and having people come talk to us, or having the opportunity to be able to have these conversations, may be a reminder to us that we don't have to pray for those that have gone before us. God, they're already in your presence, not because of anything they've done, but because of what you've done for them. And God, give us opportunities to be able to share that unbelievable same message of grace with others. And God, continue to work in our hearts as we find ourselves knowing that you've given us grace, but man, sometimes we struggle to dole that grace out. We want to hold on to it rather than let it flow through us. And so continue to work on our hearts as we become more and more amazed by your unconditional love for us that we might do the same for others. God, these things we ask in your precious and holy name. Amen.